Shortly before the U.S. announced its withdrawal from the council, the international body denounced Washington's new policy on immigration control, which has seen children being separated from their parents. On Sunday, the investigative non-profit organization ProPublica published audio of what it claims were children crying in a detention facility run by U.S. Customs and Border Protection. <laughs> And the audio has added fuel to the fire of ongoing criticism leveled at the new migration policy. Congrats. The separation policy that you sold to your boss, Mr. Trump, will result in images that will crater you both. We will ensure you will never escape them. In your fascist zeal, you forgot that mothers are mothers first, regardless of their politics. Trump has a monstrous policy of holding children hostage to build his unfeasible wall that he promised Mexico was going to pay for. His political negotiation tactic is to literally torture children who are trying to escape violence and abuse already. What's happening to families at the border is horrific. Nursing infants being ripped away from their mothers, parents being told their toddlers are being taken to bathe or play, only to realize hours later they aren't coming back. This is a moral and humanitarian crisis. Introduced in April, the so-called zero-tolerance policy on illegal border crossings means children whose parents are charged with illegal entry are separated from them and held at special facilities. Over the last six weeks alone, over 2,000 children have been placed inside those detention centers. Despite a public outcry, the White House has defended its tough stance on illegal immigration. The United States will not be a migrant camp and it will not be a refugee holding facility. It won't be. This administration did not create a policy of separating families at the border. We have a statutory responsibility that we take seriously to protect alien children from human smuggling, trafficking, and other criminal actions while enforcing our immigration laws. We will separate those who claim to be a parent and child if we cannot determine a familiar or custodial relationship exists. Parents who entered illegally are, by definition, criminals. Illegal entry is a crime as determined by Congress. By entering our country illegally, often in dangerous circumstances, illegal immigrants have put their children at risk. And the law on separating children from parents charged with immigration offenses was actually in place during Obama's tenure, though its enforcement was much rarer back then. Earlier, my colleague Nadira Tudor got a reaction from both sides of the argument. First of all, it's not true that all these people are arrested for just crossing the border. They're arrested for illegally crossing the border. There are points of entry where they could come and seek political asylum, but these these people, uh, if in fact they are uh, families and not, uh, you know, uh, sex traffickers or others who come with children, um, elect to break the U.S. law by entering and, and crashing the border illegally. Despite the fact that they're looking for a better life, surely they know the risks involved and that might be that they are separated from their children if they go in illegally. Even if they're doing it legally, which oftentimes is just the racism that you uh, hear from people like Trump and people like uh, my uh, debate counterpart here. In the case of these people coming to the United States, it's not quite as simple as just uh, having to meet specific points of entry. People are fleeing incredible violence and they're coming here uh, you know, to try to seek political asylum. And I, I don't understand how in any way that justifies taking their kids away and deporting the family. And we are seeing Trump take advantage of this and turn this into a twisted, sadistic uh, kind of policy. 
and really fueling his political base. Okay. To just I'm glad he's getting a speech in and called me a racist, which I'm not surprised. It doesn't anger me. I, I wouldn't expect anything else from a leftist who has no facts and throws out the racist word without even knowing who I am. And nothing I said was racist. But that aside, uh, do you know there's a 300 percent increase in kids coming to this country presented with an adult who turn out to be sex traffickers or, or pedophiles or others who are not their parents. And by the way, I'm sure you were as outraged, sir, when Barack Obama did virtually the same thing, in fact, deported Mexican children back to Mexico without their parents' knowledge. Where was the outrage when that was going on? Where was the outrage when he sent children all over the country? when they entered this country illegally with their parents. I didn't hear a peep out of people like you on the left. This is nothing more than an attempt to villainize Donald Trump. We're a country of laws. If these parents choose to put their kids at risk by breaking the law, they're going to suffer the consequences. And the American people are fine with that. Not all Democrats are the same. There, there's plenty of criticism to give to what Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton at the State Department did to immigrants that were here. I have lived my entire life hearing the kind of rhetoric and dog whistles from racists like Donald Trump and yourself. I mean, I think what's what's happening you now is all nerve, exposed sir, now. You got, a, you got a lot of nerve. I, I'd like to give you one, give me one example of how I'm a racist. Well, the, the, the kind of narrative that you're creating to try to, to in the false acts that you're putting out there to kind of say that, really, that all these should obey the law, that's racist? Are, you're, 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 you're using a very particular propaganda tool to try to create really? a generalization obey the law. that immigrants wow, that's propaganda, propaganda. All right. That is racist. Obey the law. Imagine that. Imagine that. How about... Yeah, well, at one time, people owned slaves, and that was the law as well, I'm sure. There's plenty of people okay. in this country, like yourself, you know what? that have... You a, diminish. A, a, you, a, sir, you diminish slavery. To go back to the you 1950s... You diminish slavery, and you diminish, and you diminish real and, racism. Hello?
regardless of what it, what it's going to do to me. My name is Alex Yef and I'm the curator and custodian of the Maryland Cryptid Collection, an extensive menagerie of extinct and unclassified preserved animal specimens, amongst them the supposed cadavers of creatures thought to be no more than myth. I was approached in 2007 to oversee the examination and documentation of Maryland's extensive diaries. Um, I work alongside a team of specialists whose job it is to examine each study case to ascertain the history um, and the historical significance, uh, the species and the research carried out by Marilyn and his colleagues. The collection was the life's work of Thomas Theodore Marilyn. Um, he was a wealthy naturalist born in 1782. He travelled alone extensively seeking out items and specimens to add to his treasure trove. Um, his collection itself grew exponentially, uh, adding the preserved bodies of creatures that defied classification. Even into his late 80s, he continued to seek out elusive knowledge. Uh, despite his great age, he never appeared to be any older than 40 years old. His collection soon became the stuff of legend and he was all but forgotten until 1942 um, when uh, a series of donations were made to an orphanage including a London townhouse and according to newspaper records uh, the do donation came from Thomas Theodore of Maryland. In 2006 the house was sold and was due for demolition when the foundations were examined, a sealed room was found. Uh, within this space were thousands of wooden shipping containers. Uh, on closer inspection, the crates were found to contain biological specimens, and the entire contents was uh, moved from the cellar to a facility where it could be properly examined. I think I knew from the beginning that, the, uh, that they were all real, that it wasn't a hoax. Um, I was presented with uh, a wealth of information um, and all of these kind of self-contained studies of each species. The saving grace was, was Marilyn's attention to detail. He was fastidious, he recorded everything, um, he presented everything in a very matter-of-fact way. You had thousands of biological samples and, uh, and a wealth of, of annotated drawings. And, um, but I think the problem is that he spoke of ideas, uh, anachronisms, um, that, that kind of now, looking back, they, you could doubt them. He was talking about DNA in the 1850s, and obviously DNA wasn't discovered until much later than that. I was employed to examine a series of preserved animal cell samples, just told to analyse the samples and to record any interesting qualities. Although the cells appeared dead, they were in fact in a dormant state. I submerged them in a culture medium and managed to coax them back to life. These were 2,000 year old skin cells, the DNA like nothing I'd ever seen before. After I submitted my findings to my superiors, I was asked if the cells could have been fabricated or interfered with to create such qualities. I said no. Um, I think that so many of these, these species are kind of wrapped up in folklore and mythology and the kind of core idea of a, of, of a species is lost because we're dealing with animals that li existed in such small numbers that you can't really, there's, no, there's not enough information and, and Marilyn was recording this a hundred years ago um, and even then he was saying he was, you know, his, his studies would show that these species were, um, were dying out through, mainly through the encroachment of man into all areas of the world. Um, I wanted to cover really quickly about 
some of the things he had already said. They showed right there what appeared to be some sort of dragon, a baby dragon. And that's also one of the things that you can see in history books that uh, are just explained away as, as myth. You know, you'll find it in various writings, uh, historical writings. Alexander the Great even mentioned seeing dragons pull the chariot of a certain king in India. So, of course, you have these writings of people, uh, particularly secular historians, that believe in evolution. They just automatically dismiss it as being folklore, fake, fairy tale, even though it was written by someone as prominent as Alexander the Great. You would think Alexander the Great, if he's writing something historically down, he's not going to just make up stuff as he's going. But they have to explain away what they see in these writings. And you see also, like with these writings from the conquistadors, when they went uh, to South and Central America, you have these writings of them seeing uh, Inca civilization. They found even a cave with three giant skeletons sitting on thrones. And here is two citations right here. Reginaldo de Lizarraga, Dominican cleric and chronicler. In his brief description of the land of Peru, 1595, there were once giants here and the natives say that they don't know from hence they came. Their houses were three leagues below the anchorage made of two gables with very large beams. And here's another quote added to this are the known traditions that all of these giants whose bones are still seen this day in that beautiful place died in flames because a young handsome man these indians did not know of the existence of angels threw lightning down upon them and incinerated all of them leaving only their bones that they would remain as a dreadful witness antonio de la calanca Augustinian monk and anthropologist, the moral chronicle of order of St. Augustine in Peru, 1663. So you can see here they have historical books back then that mention about these. You also have mentioning of these three giants on thrones and they had found sacrificial remains of humans below before them that they had actually sacrificed unto these false gods, literal beings in skeletal form on thrones and it talks about how that the conquistadors actually burned and destroyed a lot of these giant skeletons they found so that might explain also why you can't find much evidence for things like this these strange stories of vampires and werewolves and dragons and, and giants of the past that they've turned into fairy tales because the original element, the truth that was really behind them, you know, the real stories of giants, the real stories of dragons, like you see with the historical writings of Alexander the Great and many other people, these have been uh, deemed automatically fake by modern scholarship because of their ideological paradigm. They believe in evolution. They don't believe that there's such things as giants in the past, so they automatically dismiss anything they see in any historical book from the past that says these things. And you'd be shocked because when you go to school, you, you, you obviously take classes in history, but they never tell you that these historians that write these historical books, they have their own paradigm. And then when they've researched primary sources, you know, ancient writings maybe from the 1500s or 1400s that talk about things like giants or dragons, they just automatically dismiss it and they filter it through their ideology when they write their own historical book. And they're essentially presenting history through their own eyes rather than you getting the original source of history. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing here with this cryptid museum. We have this eccentric rich man who basically went around the world and looked for odd specimens like this. And we're looking at some of them right now. Uh, we have their website right here. And here are some of the specimens. Let's just check it out really quick. Draco Magnus. I think that's really interesting looking. We have also Bowers and the Life. I haven't even looked at all these yet. Look at that. Isn't that really interesting? You know, obviously some people are going to just easily and quickly dismiss all these strange artifacts. But... Perhaps, you know, it sounds like obviously they've done testing 
on some of these and perhaps many of these are actually real we don't know exactly i mean obviously he's showing here how they were doing testing on on a couple specimens i think i think he was doing some testing on i don't know if it was this i it was some sort of dragon looking thing i think it might have been this one here infant draco which appears to be basically a dragon okay and there's many stories about dragons there's tons of historical references to dragons you can even find pottery inca pottery mayan pottery that has literal drawings of dinosaurs and dragons on them and even showing the the the, the, the shape of the scales of certain types of dinosaurs which would be basically impossible to know unless you've actually seen it because some some modern scientists have actually looked at some of this pottery and said you know we actually found one of these scales preserved and it looked just like the shape that they were drawing on this pottery they have pottery of them riding dragons killing dragons we have lots of stories you know you have the princess being saved by a knight killing a dragon there's lots of stories of, of knights killing dragons and of course everyone classifies this as myth fairy tale but what is the true story behind these stories it, was there originally dragons that roamed certain places in, in in Europe and now it's just considered fairy tale and fake because we have this ideology of evolution that requires these things to have been extinct for millions of years when maybe some of these species were around even now even recent you know there's actually some um I saw some newspaper articles from like the 1890s or something 1901 of they're actually seeing brontosaurus in the congo and of course now oh that's crazy there's no brontosaurus in the congo i don't think there's any now but there might have been some back in the 1800s still less hanging around you know somehow managed to survive even till the 1800s in the congo of course we're not talking about you know your backyard here we're talking congo which is basically a swamp the size of texas all right so let's just check out more of what he has to say here let's but if you look at these species individually for instance the vampire homo vampiris it's a hominid it has a, an immuno efficiency virus it's a virus which must have encountered at some point in its evolution it changed its genetics to serve the virus it, but it also benefited the the, the host um, by extending its life I think that you have to look at these things from a very matter-of-fact point of view or, or you are lost in, in the kind of mythology and folklore of these species. You can talk about fairies and demons and dragons, but um, you're talking about uh, the possibility that over thousands of years these, have, these myths have existed and a lot of myths are um, at some point founded in reality and I guess it's our job here to kind of piece those ideas together and find out if there's actually a valid species. I also wanted to mention really quickly, uh, there's actually, uh, I did a video on dragons and sort of some of the history with regards to dragons and how there's actually evidence that there was two different types of dragons that essentially lived not, you know, not super long ago. Okay, there was one that was in the water that lived aquatic and there's one that was able to fly. Now, of course, like I said, today they just explain this all away, but we even have we even have ancient stories like the bell and the dragon. And here we go. This is actually a story. Uh, it is from the book of Daniel. So you even have stories like this in the Bible. Of course, like I said, they explain all this stuff away. You also have, uh, like I mentioned, Alexander the Great, dragon, all right so you have these stories and of course all right here we go in 330 bc after alexander the great invaded india he brought back reports of seeing a great hissing dragon living in a cave which people were worshiping as a god one of alexander the great's lieutenants on citrus stated that the king abyssarus kept serpents that were 120 to 210 feet long subsequent greek rulers are said to have brought dragons back alive from ethiopia so you have these historical references like that okay and this is what they're talking about in these books of course when a modern historian reads that they're like oh that's got to be fake what why would they write that why, why would a historian write something fake 
back then? What is historians not have a standard back then? You see what I'm getting? You see what I'm getting at? So, all right. So I'm going to show you some references here from various historians and writers and scholars and philosophers from the ancient past. You have to ask yourself. If you have a reputation such as a Greek philosopher, are you gonna taint your reputation by making up myths and fairy tales while you're talking about things? I don't think so. So let's check this out. According to the Roman scholar Pliny the Elder, a dragon could strangle an elephant with its tail. Perhaps Pliny heard stories about pythons which can crush and devour large animals, though elephants are beyond their capability. So so if someone is trying to explain it away here, you're like Okay, so obviously he's not telling the truth here. There couldn't have been dragons strangling elephants. So maybe he just somehow made it up. And he's somehow referencing it from pythons. Okay, the dragons of the mountains at scale of golden color and in length excel those of the plain. And they have bushy beards, which also are of a golden hue and their eye is sunk deep under their eyebrow and emits a terrible and ruthless glance. Greek scholar Philostratus. Stratus. We have alleged science essentially being shoved down our throat from, from birth. <laughs> as soon as we get into school, even in the home, even in cartoons we watch uh, while we're little children, reinforce this alleged science, which contradicts historical data. We have two types of evidence here, primal fascia evidence and alleged scientific evidence, which contradict each other. Why? They should not contradict each other. This is, this is the point I'm trying to make. They should not contradict each other. Now here we have the elites those who are running the show putting out false information on basically fallacious websites claiming that the Smithsonian admits to the destruction of thousands of giant human skeletons which of course they did do either that or they've just hidden them one of the two because we have evidence that they did indeed take all these giant human skeletons we have all the newspaper uh, articles indicating this all from different states from the from the 1900s and even earlier showing the Smithsonian coming in and taking giant human skeletons we're talking about published newspaper articles detailing all these facts that the Smithsonian came in and took all these giant human skeletons where did they go so then the way to disinformation is for them to have all these fake websites put out this false article the Smithsonian admits to destruction of thousands of giant human skeletons why would they do that to discredit those who know the truth that they did take and hide or destroy giant human skeletons but they want to put out this fake all right so you get kind of the idea there so you can actually look up these these various ancient historical books and see various sayings from various philosophers and scholars of the past talking about dragons, dinosaurs, and a lot of other things. But, <laughs> and giants, and there's a lot of things that they reference and people would be shocked what they wrote. And these are scholars. Why would a scholar taint or ruin their own reputation making up fairy tales when they're not going to? So the only way they would write something like that is if it was common knowledge and everybody already accepted it at that time frame when they lived. But today, it's considered fairy tales and you're crazy if you talk about this. But it's really funny that scholars of the past, Greek philosophers, famous people, Pliny the Younger from Rome, all these famous people from the past that are historians write these things and secular historians just completely ignore it and report only what is okay with today. And so you never get to hear about any of this stuff and you're just you're just told you're crazy to think any of this kind of stuff. And so then when you see something like this uh, Merlin Cryptid Museum, you just assume, oh, it's gotta be fake. Come on, man, give me a break. 
But what if actually this stuff is real? What if quite a few of these are real? We don't exactly know, but apparently they're doing some sort of DNA testing on it. And it appears a lot of the specimens are real. This is one of them that they were testing. I don't know how many they tested, but I just find it very interesting. So could some of these things still be around today in just very remote areas, you know, in some re you know remote wilderness area? You know, like that, that footage I showed in the beginning of Bigfoots, that was actually, I think, at Yellowstone Park, if I recall. I, I think it was in that area, if I recall. Um, it, I, I can't remember offhand totally. I'd have to go check it. But it was it was some sort of national park. And uh, you saw how big they were. They, compared to the buffalo, they were very huge. They were really tall. So they were clearly very tall, like eight or nine foot tall. And they, were, and they looked like Bigfoots. I mean, do you know people that look hairy like that? I don't. I don't think monkeys walk erect like that or gorillas. Okay, it's just, it's really strange. So, uh, you know, you have this various footage that comes out, but it's always, you know, difficult to 100% prove something. And, and even if you did, here's the thing, you know, I kind of think there are people who have actually tried to come out with real physical evidence. Like, look, I have it right here. Kind of like this cryptid museum. But... As soon as it get, gains any credibility, I think certain people who don't want you to know about this stuff bury it in some fashion. Whether it be through articles to, trying to debunk it. Yeah, Snopes. Snopes debunked it. You know? Snopes is completely politically driven. I, I don't know if you know. Just go check it out. Pretty much anytime anything political comes out, they, they debunk the side that they don't like. So Snopes is no longer credible. It, I don't even know if it ever was credible. I remember back like 10, 15 years ago thinking it was credible. But that was a long time ago. And it's not even the same owner running it. It's a new per. It's actually, it's actually the husband. They had a divorce and he was out. I don't know if you want to know this or not, but he was out basically cheating on her uh, from what I understand and sleeping with a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of hoes, I guess you would say. Um, yeah, he was not exactly the upstanding you know, husband figure. Let's just put it that way. And he's the guy behind Snopes, okay? So <laughs> go look it up yourself. See, <laughs> see if I'm telling the truth. So that's that's the that's the reputable Snopes, you know? Everybody believes. It's just kind of funny. So uh, there's always disinformation. There's always someone trying to, to, to control the narrative, control what you know, what you believe.